All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Aaron Evans. I'm with the COVID-19 Council Committee. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, very first thing I'd like to do is make a motion that pursuant to Governor Lee's executive order number 71 regarding electronic meetings, I make a motion that this committee meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the Metropolitan Council and that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. With that, I will move on and um, take a look at our uh, panelists today. Looks like we have Councilman Brandon Taylor here. So Brandon, I see you on the list. Um, and then I've gotten a text message from Councilman O'Connell, uh, Councilman uh, Pulley and Councilwoman Johnston are not here yet, but we will go ahead and carry on without them. Um, so today during our call, I wanted to spend some time um, getting into um, really some of the legislation and activities uh, from 2020 that have carried over into 2021 that have been helpful to the community uh, related to uh, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, and really talk about some of those programming efforts and how they've impacted um, not only Nashville's business owners but also residents. And so the first uh, person that I wanted to have speak is uh, Executive Director Benton McDonough from the Beer Board. Um, Councilman Syracuse, I do not see on the call at this time. Um, if he joins us a little bit later, I'll recognize him uh, to give uh, a little perspective about why he wanted to work with the Beer Board to bring this forward. Uh, so, Mr. McDonough, I will turn it over to you to share more about beer delivery. Great. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking you and the members of the committee today for uh, inviting me here this afternoon to uh, discuss the beer board and, and uh, the, the work that we've done related to delivery and curbside. Uh, now, if, if you would allow me uh, just, just a moment, bear with me. I, I would like to lay a little bit of the foundation on uh, exactly how we got here from, from last year to, uh, to today. Uh, ju just the other day, my wife and I were reminiscing uh, this week about uh, how we were at the happiest place on earth uh, this very week last year uh, when we took our two little girls to uh, to uh, Disney World and uh, we were uh, blissfully unaware like a lot of people uh, about the uh, the year that that awaited us when uh, when we returned um, but uh, I returned for my my first day back to work it was the uh, first Monday in March and uh, that evening was when the uh, tornado uh, first struck uh, Nashville and uh, it, it was, a, as you remember, a devastating tornado. And, and while we were recovering from that, you know, we were also aware of the uh, global pandemic that, that was gaining strength on the uh, on the horizon. Uh, and in the days and weeks that that followed that, um, there there were discussions about potentially closing businesses, and you know, we we knew that that would have a significant impact on uh, on our industry. And so, um, in early to mid March, um, I can recall a, a gentleman that. Uh, owned one of our uh, one of our businesses. He showed up in my office and uh, sat across from me and and told me about the hardships uh, that that came about due to the tornado and and now the, the hardship that he was facing with the uh, pandemic that that was uh, bearing down on us. And I remember that he had tears in his eyes as he recounted that uh, uh, that he was afraid of of what was to come. And it was at that moment that I assured him that the beer board would do everything within. Then it's power to help them. And so that that weekend with uh, the conversation fresh on my mind, I, I spoke with uh, with our chairman, Brian Taylor, and uh, we, we brainstormed on ways that uh, that that we we could help the beer and hospitality industries when the, the businesses might be required to close due to the due to the pandemic. At, at that time, it, we came up with delivery and curbside, and it was uh, two days later on uh, Monday, March 16th, that we convened a, a small group of industry leaders to uh, to to move forward and, and make that happen. And so during that time, I, I, I reached out and contacted the uh, Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission, the TABC, uh, to discuss the, the legal ramifications of, of state law and uh, delivery of of, uh, of beer. Also reached out to the mayor's office regarding policy issues, uh, Metro legal, and uh, as well as members of the, the council to, to share our plan. And uh, every single person that I spoke to was uh, was extremely supportive of, of our idea. And uh, and now within four days of of that meeting, we we created the emergency language, and scheduled an emergency hearing, uh, passing the the emergency rules on Friday, March the twentieth. 
Um, we were the first regulatory agency in Tennessee to allow curbside delivery, uh, which was followed by Memphis and then Chattanooga, and then later that next week by, by the, the state itself. Uh, more importantly, the Metro leading the state on this issue uh, was, was the fact that these actions uh, save jobs and, and livelihoods. Uh, I can remember that one brewery owner stated that they had to lay off their entire hourly staff due to the pandemic on Thursday, March 19th, but then they were able to uh, to rehire all of them the next day when we passed the emergency rules. And I can tell you that, that we have numerous examples of, of that story with, within the industry that, I, uh, that I'm aware of. And uh, after extending the emergency rules uh, several times throughout the year, uh, we, we determined that we would try to make delivery and curbside a, a permanent uh, permit for, uh, for our permit holders. And with the help and support of, of Mayor Cooper, uh, Councilman Syracuse offering his full support and sponsoring the bill and, and the full support of members of the council, uh, we, uh, we were able to create delivery and curbside on a, on a permanent basis. While this assisted our permit holders in saving jobs throughout the year, uh, just as important was the permanency uh, gave the industry the consistency that that they had been lacking throughout uh, throughout the year due to the, due to the pandemic. And uh, many business owners mentioned that the permanency allowed them at that time to uh, to plan their business model around adding a, a new stream of revenue and services to their customers. Secondary to uh, to all of this, um, as you would expect in a global pandemic, the the beer board has seen a significant reduction in the overall number of applications that, that have been submitted uh, the, this year. Uh, creating a permanent delivery and curbside permit um, enabled us to create new streams of revenue through the $250 application fee and the $100 annual privilege tax. Uh, so far, we've received about 30 delivery and curbside applications, which creates close to $8,000 in application revenue. And then uh, we have another $3,000 in, in privilege tax payments that, that have been paid this year. So. I feel like it's, it's a win-win for, for everyone involved. Uh, aside from our impact on employment, one of the things that I'm proudest of for the delivering curbside is that the beer board staff and beer board members have the ability to think outside the box and create new opportunities based upon the environment that's presented to us. Uh, I believe the contributions between our department, the mayor's office, uh, Metro Council members, and Metro Legal, uh, it, it's, a, it's an example of just how well government can serve its constituents when, when necessary. And uh, I would like to close by by thanking all of you for uh, for always supporting our department and specifically uh, supporting this new permit and providing a lifeline to an industry that is so vital to the survival of our city. And uh, at this time, I'm I'm happy to take any questions that uh, that, that you all may have. I have one um, just off the top of my head, listening to what you were saying, kind of related to the. Um, the economic impact for the brewers, and then also, of course, the you know the revenue opportunities for Metro. But what's the? Do you have any stats off the top of your head related to the overall economic impact of beer sales in Nashville um, as it relates to, you know, just our city as a whole? Like, are, are we? Do we drink a lot of beer in Nashville? We, <laughs> we, we, uh, we do actually. The the uh, the city itself uh, receives about. Up until about this year, we were receiving about $20 million per year in uh, the wholesale beer tax. And so that that's the tax that's assessed on, on every individual beer that's that's sold. And so it, it's gone up steadily uh, th throughout the years um, to uh, believe last year it was it was over $20 million. And, um, you know, I believe this year it's going to be down significantly, uh, I, I think, from, from that time. But, um, but hopefully that, that number will tick back up uh, once you know, we're, we're in a better situation with the pandemic. What were some of the ways that um, you and your team marketed this opportunity to um, the, the business owners and restaurants um, that could take advantage of beer delivery? I, th I think it was a matter of, of really, I mean, it's pretty easy when, when you can tell someone this can, can save your business. You know, I, I think a lot of people get caught up in the, the idea that it, it, there wasn't like a windfall of money that came in to, to these businesses. And, and that wasn't really the, the purpose of it. The purpose was to give them a fighting chance to really be able to survive long enough in, until they could stay on their, get, get back on their feet uh, fully. So I, I think it definitely did its, did its job with that when you hear about the, the individual I was talking about in that particular case, uh, 
was tailgate brewery and they were discussing the fact that they did have to to cut loose their entire hourly staff and then once we get we passed uh curbside and delivery they were able to, to hire all of them back if if they wanted to and i believe 80 percent of them came back um but i believe a small percentage chose to, to to move on and do something else yeah that's really good information thank you for sharing um i will uh, yes. i'll stop asking questions and and one thing i'll say is in, in my area, um, we only have one bar, and so I'm, I'm not as well versed on alcohol um, related um, issues like this and, and kind of what that can mean compared to some other districts where breweries exist and things like that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm learning. So um, does anybody on the call have any questions um, for Ben that they would like to ask? looking to see if there are any hands. Um, how about the, uh, I guess one other question that I had was really around the permitting process and how how businesses and restaurants who maybe haven't taken advantage of this previously, if they're interested, what do they need to do? Really uh, just contact us. We, we can walk them through the process. We tried to make it um, as easy as possible. I mean, as long as you have uh, either an on sale or on and off sale uh, permit, then, then you're eligible to to apply for it, and so uh, you know we we tried. I I want to say there there may be four questions on there. One of those being what what's your current permit number uh, that that you currently have, whether it's on on and off, and uh, the address. Um, I have to go back and, and look it up to to be sure, but sure. we try to try to make it as easy for them because we we really wanted to give them the opportunity just to put the information in. And be able to start doing delivering curbside um, as quickly as possible. Right, makes sense. All right, let me take a, another skim through here and see if anybody has had any questions. And I do not see that there are any questions. Um, I don't see that Councilman Syracuse has joined us. If he, uh, are you staying on for the entire call? Yes, ma'am. I'll be here. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, if he pops on later, um, I may recognize him, and we may have more conversation specific to the legislation. But thank you for being here and sharing a little bit more information related to beer delivery. Happy to do it. Thank you for the invite. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Our next discussion is going to be on the temporary outdoor dining permit. Um, and this is legislation that um, uh, Sean Parker had worked on. I do not see that he is on our call. So um, I will uh, instead just go ahead and move along and we'll hear from Emily Lamb um, from Metro Codes. We'll share a little bit more about that permitting process and how it works. Hi, Council, Council Member Evans and other Council Members. Thank you all so much. So I'll give you all a brief overview of this legislation um, similar to what Benton did. Um, Initial, there already existed a sidewalk cafe permit for the downtown area before COVID. Um, and last year in the fall, Councilman Parker, he's the one I believe who sponsored the legislation to allow that to go throughout the city in an effort to say even restaurants outside of this outside of the downtown core, we want to allow them to have out sidewalk cafes so that they can have people more because the numbers of their the capacity of their restaurants was reduced by the health order we wanted to work with you know come up with ways to allow them to have serve more patrons and also keep people in the open air if they preferred that so this initially started with the idea of expanding sidewalk cafes outside of the downtown area and from there it through those discussions with um, other departments and with councilman parker and other people it came up that you know there are some restaurants who don't have a sidewalk right in front of their restaurants but they they might have another outdoor area or a um, parking lot or some other area that they might want to have outdoor seating that wouldn't necessarily meet the criteria of a sidewalk cafe so that's where this idea came from to create um, a temporary outdoor cafe now they're um and it's not it's two different permits. There's the sidewalk cafe permit and there's the, and that is good for a year. That's a one year permit. That's always been a one year permit. Um, and so that's one permit. The other permit is a temporary outdoor permit. This has an expiration date of 90 days, um, but it's renewable. It, you just, honestly, you just notify codes that you want to renew it. So, and that's more of a, um, 
not necessarily to give people not necessarily it's more of a, another tool in the toolbox so if there are restaurants who may want to try it but aren't sure they want to do it for a full year or who just want to do it for the spring when the weather is pretty so they um or then again you know the restaurants that don't have the sidewalk so we expanded it not only throughout the city but as another alternative not just sidewalks but any outdoor area so um that passed as you know and so we um, have those permits that now exist we have not seen a huge number of permit applications. I can't speak for all the restaurant owners in town. I suspect it has something to do with the fact that we're in the middle of winter. Um, but, you, I, and I, I would not be surprised if we had more applications as the weather starts warming up and spring and summer get here. Um, I know just anecdotally, recently, I, Council Member Evans, I told you this, recently I was going out, to, wanted to go out to lunch with my sister to celebrate her birthday and called multiple restaurants around town to see if they had out, outdoor seating, if they did, did they have heaters, would they take reservations? So I know it's a concern for members of the public. Um, and so that's what that's what we have tried to accommodate here. Councilman Parker, um, initially the sidewalk cafe permit, um, there's a $100 fee for those permits and the council waived that fee. Um, and that's for the year long permit. The temporary outdoor permit that's a $50 fee and that is simply because it's a we again when we looked at this and worked with other departments there are multiple departments that are involved in this review um, when we create these permit applications we track the planning department public works the beer board health department and also the fire marshal so there are multiple departments and multiple metro employees who are reviewing these um, and so we assigned the same $50 is any use permit it's the same $50 fee as any use permit um the difference being because it's expired after 90 days you don't have to pay that $50 every time you renew it it's it's the one time the initial application fee and the way that you apply for these is simply um back when covid first hit we created the um permit application inbox it's permit application at nashville.gov i'm happy to repeat that later if i need to and you, the restaurant owners simply email that email address with their, their address, you know, letting us know that they want to do this permit, this outdoor dining permit, and as well as a site plan. And we need a site plan that is, it's very rudimentary, just basically their seating and where that's going to be. We then create the permit application, track the departments I just listed. Um, if it's not in the right of way, Public Works would just ignore it. For example, but we track all of these departments so they can look at each application individually and determine if they need to weigh in and then they would either ignore it or approve it or if the fire marshal has you know, life safety concerns, they might work with the property owner to work around those. Uh, we track the health department, particularly so they can check the seating and the distance, make sure it's complying with the distance regulations. Um, and like I said, we have not seen a ton of applications. I would not be surprised if we see more. Um, we'd be thrilled to see more. We'd love to work with the restaurant owners around town. Um, and that's pretty much it by way of history and my information that I have prepared, although I'm happy to answer any questions. I see a couple of hands up there, so I'll let you moderate that, Councilmember Evans. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that information. On, um, it, one, I guess one question that I have off the top of my head is because, like you said, we haven't seen a ton of applications. So there's a tremendous opportunity for mm -hmm. council members to be spreading the word as I know and you know it, we, we we talked about it when the legislation was passed but as you mentioned we're heading into winter so not mm -hmm. as much interest so this is a, a, a great time to kind of be circling back and, and getting the word out what um, in the codes department do you uh, share your communications resources with public work so like Courtney um, Stone is she your communications person as well or we do you have a separate or do you have one we have a separate one, um, although they, you know, the d different departmental PIOs all work in conjunction um, with each other. So it's, I know that probably most likely Courtney would work with ours, you know, ours is um, Evan Cathy. So, oh, okay. um, and we share him with planning. So we don't share Courtney, but we do share him with planning who, as I said, is tracked on this. Uh, Benton, I don't, does, does Evan, Evan might do beer boards as well. I'm not sure. Um, so there is certainly some overlap and the, the PIOs are, are certainly used to working together. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, who would be a good resource for like me to follow up with to be able to talk about, hey, is there something that could be created that then we could disseminate in newsletters and right. social media and things like that. Right. So Evan is my contact, so I'll follow up with him. So I appreciate sure. that information. So let me take a look um, at the hands uh, that are raised. And I know I saw uh, Councilman um, O'Connell, so we'll start with you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Lamb, can you speak a little bit to the actual mechanics of the permit process? I know you mentioned several departments in the mix there. I know of at least um, one applicant who spoke to some, I guess, <laughs> let's call them opportunities for streamlining on the public work side of things. So I just, uh, can you help me understand, like if somebody were to complete this process, you know, is this sort of a one-stop shop thing or do they have to go here and then here? And sure. Then here? Sure, and I'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up. I meant to touch on that and then um, I made the colossal mistake of going from my memory and not having any notes in front of me. So I'm glad you reminded me of that. Um, as I said, sidewalk cafes have existed in the downtown core for pre prior to this and Public Works handled those. So when we determined that we were gonna create this additional option for restaurant owners, we decided, worked with Shannon Whitelaw um, worked with other departments and decided, it, as you said, it would just make more sense to streamline the whole process. So we have moved all of the applications to the codes department. There, yeah. there was initially some confusion with people applying to the public works because that's where they have historically applied and who, you know, who do we apply to? And so we've streamlined it. Um, and again, we've worked with public works on that. So they're aware and everybody should be on the same page. But if you, it, whether it's a sidewalk cafe permit or whether it's a temporary outdoor dining permit, and honestly, that's the kind of thing that restaurant owners might not even know. But once we get the application, we can review them and, and have conversations with them and work with them to determine which permit it is they actually need. So they will send that to the permit application inbox. We have uh, two people who are overseeing that inbox. Joey Hargis and John Michael are overseeing that inbox. And so they can assign it to the appropriate zoning examiner. And then it's just treated like any other permit application. The zoning examiner looks at it, checks the site plan, and tracks the necessary departments, and then it sends the automatic notice to the necessary departments who do their review. Um, so it is all streamlined. They all, what, regardless of which permit or, or which type of outdoor dining your, the restaurants are wanting to do, they would all come through the codes department. Okay, that is extremely helpful because I think what happened was I probably got somebody who was caught in between, had been familiar right, with right. the old way, started at Public Works, and probably was not yet familiar with uh, with the transition to code. Sure, so sure. That is helpful. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, and thank you, Councilman um, O'Connell. Uh, Councilman Cash, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask this, uh, Emily, but I had a constituent or a business owner in my district that was curious about it. Do we have any sort, have we, have we made any sort of mechanism for, uh, like we have more, many more restaurants doing pickup, and some businesses have parking lots that that works for. I've got some business in my district that pretty much rely on public parking for uh, stuff. And I'm just curious if there's been any, if there have been any kind of permit or forgiveness or um, for like taking a public space and and blocking it off for the ability to, for cars to pick up there. I mean, I, I suspect not, but I just kind of wondered if there's any thinking about that. Um, that has not been brought up in any conversations I've been a part of yet. Um, that would probably be a conversation for public works because that would be considered yeah. the right of way. So it may be an issue right. of, um, and, and again, the, not being public works, I'm, I'm kind of going flying off the cuff right. here. So take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, it may be an issue of getting some kind of street closure permit from public works. Um, and I don't know, you know, they may have a particular kind of permit for closing off street parking, but that, that would be public works who would they'd want to work with. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I have numerous restaurants that considered the closing off of streets to kind of expand cafes, but they were doing, enough, you know, they were their pickup or their takeout business was so that they didn't want to, you know, close off streets to mm -hmm. stop the traffic from the customers okay. that wanted to pick up stuff. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Councilman Cash. Um, scrolling, I do not see that there are any additional questions and I do not see Councilman Parker. So um, if there are no additional questions, then we will keep moving. And um, Emily Lamb, thank you for being here and explaining this great information. I'll follow up, I'll put it down as a takeaway to, uh, for me to follow up with um, Evan Cathy and, and see if we can get some more information out to the council about how we can disseminate it uh, to business owners as we move into spring. So thank sure. you for and being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And, and you know, we want to do whatever we can to help council members as well as the public. So just let us know how we can help. Okay. Thank you so much.
All right. Um, with that, we're going to transition into slow streets. And this was one that residents, a lot of residents in my area had a lot of questions about um, related to slow streets and, and how they could mitigate some of the speeding in their neighborhoods and, and open up streets. And so I was really excited that uh, Nora Kern and Walk Bike Nashville and Derek Haggerty at Public Works uh, brought this program back. And so I know on the call we have Nora Kern. Um, and so Nora, and I also see Brenda Perez from Walk Bike Nashville uh, and Derek Haggerty. So we will go ahead, um, Nora, I'll, I'll kick it off over to you. And so that way you can uh, share with the, your team. Hi, yes, I think actually Derek is going to start with the spring version and then okay, Brenda great. Perez, who's our community engagement coordinator, is going to talk a little bit about our involvement in the fall. So I'll very I'll good. Thank first. you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you, Nora. So just starting off, slow streets is simply soft closures of streets, um, still allowing people to drive to their houses, still allowing deliveries. We're just asking that there's no through traffic in the area. Right after COVID uh, kind of started off, got big, we saw these streets popping up around the country. Oakland, California, Denver, Colorado, some of the first streets to do this. Um, you know, it was on some of the national transportation news websites, areas, and it caught the eye of the mayor's office. April 15th, they asked us if we could do something similar here in Nashville. And we just happened to have a, a section of code that really allows us to do this exact thing. Um, I believe it's section 12.12.150 allows public works to establish play streets, which you know, is a slow street. Uh, a road closed to through traffic, except for deliveries and residents, uh, to encourage people to play in the streets. Um, so we had that mechanism in place. Um, April 15th, it was requested. April 22nd, we had our first recommendation of streets to the mayor's office. Uh, and at this time, we were still struggling with, you know, how does outreach look during COVID? This was early in the pandemic. We're still figuring out how to use WebEx, Zoom, mm -hmm. Microsoft Teams, everything else there. This is actually the first meeting I've been in that has not had technical difficulties. So congratulations <laughs> on that aspect. Um, so we relied on some existing outreach we had done. Uh, we took the Walk and Bike Nashville plan, looked at the priority bikeways uh, that were laid out for future build out and overlaid our traffic calming applications on that. So where those two documents matched, you know, where there had already been some outreach, already some consideration, those were the streets we selected for our initial round of slow streets. Um, once we had them selected, we notified the council members and the traffic calming applicant, who's almost in all cases a resident of the area. So there was a little bit of outreach there, but not to the extent we would have liked, I think. And that was one of the lessons learned uh, going into the fall session with Walk Bike Nashville. Uh, we simply use materials that we had on hand, on hand signs that our sign shop already had, um, some tripods to set them up on, put them out on the street. So really besides labor, um, no cost to the city. Um, and we implemented these on May 9th. That was right after, not the tornado, but the other windstorm that blew through. So it delayed our rollout by about a week, week and a half. Um, but May 9th, we had them out on the street and they stayed until June 22nd, which is when we moved from phase two to phase three at the time. Um, towards the end of that, we sent out a survey. We had about 200 individuals complete it. Uh, two thirds of those either lived or worked on or near Slow Street. We found 60% responded that they felt it was easier to social distance and they felt safer on those streets. 22% uh, said they felt it was less easy to social distance and they felt less safe. Overall, three quarters of the respondents thought uh, that the positives outweighed the negatives of this program. Really our big takeaway from that first round though is that we wanted to stick to low volume streets. So even though traffic volumes were down, we didn't wanna reroute traffic through neighborhood routes. And uh, we also wanted to stay away from businesses really for the reason that council member Cash mentioned a lot of businesses were relying on drive up deliveries and they wanted that access, which we completely understand. So following that June 22nd date, um, 
that we had picked up. Slow Streets was over until Walk Bike Nashville came to us in October. And I'll let Nora and Brenda speak towards that. All right. Um, so Nora and Brenda, uh, you all are on. Yeah, I'll just turn it over to Brenda. Brenda's our community engagement coordinator and and was hired right before this, so she got thrown in the deep end and um, and, and led the fall program. Okay, great, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. And that was just kind of thrown into that program, but it was a great program to be thrown in through. Um, so in the fall, we launched the Slow Streets program. We wanted to make sure we gave enough time for like outreach. Um, and shifted it a little bit to have the applications be resident led. Um, so we emailed the application process through walk bikes, national email list, through social medias, through various council members to just get people to apply in addition to folks who had applied for the traffic calming, um, applications in the past. So we had a total of 112 applications come in from 22 zip codes. So it's a lot of people that wanted to bring uh, this type of programming into their community. Um, and we're excited that the program was able to expand to 15 miles. So in the spring, it was seven and a half miles. Uh, in the fall, it was 15 miles. Uh, Walk Bike Nashville did like a pre-selection of 12 neighborhoods that we thought would be good neighborhoods to bring the Slow Streets program based on community interest, neighborhood support, number of volunteers that were identified in the application, geographic, uh, geographic diversity and economic diversity. Uh, we sent those over to Derek and then Derek had to finesse the list a little bit more. Uh, so we ended up with 10 sites. Um, and then we did the slow streets rollout. Uh, this is, I think, where we had a mass improvement over the spring process. So there was a lot more uh, resident engagement. Uh, there was conversations uh, to prep people and like what it was going to look like to get people to uh, take a lot of ownership into it. And there were some communities that did a really great job with that. Um, so residents did like uh, flyers uh, in their neighborhoods to other residents to let other residents know that this was coming. Um, some residents in North Nashville talked to the businesses that were close by because uh, there was a closure close to Jefferson and uh, some residents went in there and left that information and affirmed the business owners that this was going to be beneficial. Um, and then we equipped uh, residents to distribute drive slower signs in three languages. So we had English, Spanish and Arabic to represent uh, the diversity of the communities, uh, especially in South Nashville. Um, and then we released a feedback form from the beginning, uh, which allowed you know, residents to voice their opinions, which we want all the time. Um, and that feedback form was live through all of October and then two weeks uh, after November to just gather as much as we could. Really well, generally 64% of people supported the Slow Streets program. Uh, I think it was 65% of people that want, 65% wanted uh, to see it more often. Um, a lot of people, like 75%, were using it for walking, wheelchair rolling, jogging, biking. Um, a lot of people were using it uh, for multiple times a day. So generally, it got really good, good feedback. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to repeat the program. I think there's um, a lot of space for us to consider what it would look like from a public health standpoint as well, as we think about uh, you know, just communities that are impacted at a different rates by COVID. Um, and then I think I'm just going to pass it on to Nora, who can fill in some gaps that I'm sure I left. So. Thank you. Yeah, I think the last element just of the analysis was we wanted to um, see if if the program was also effectively reducing speeds and volumes, because that was the, the main goal. And so we used a, a program called Streetlight, which is uh, uses mega data, cell phone data to analyze traffic patterns. Um, which we had an access to through a grant. Um, and if you're interested in all the graphs, we actually did it neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, but overall, we saw that there had been prior to the slow streets, a really big increase in walking um, uh, in the neighborhoods, which is what we were hearing from people. A lot of people out, you know, working from home and, and walking on their neighborhood streets. Um, speeds had been up citywide, especially on neighborhood streets. Um, so I, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. And so there was a lot of a lot of interest in this program. The program itself in October 
um, did successfully reduce traffic volumes in most of the neighborhoods so that the total number of cars was down for the month of October. But it didn't have a noticeable impact on traffic speeds and and Derek and I have have and Brenda have brainstormed some ideas, but I think you know that the, the um, interventions are mostly at the entrance to the neighborhoods, but once people got inside, um, they returned to their normal driving behavior. So I think some 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 good benefits, um, but definitely room for improvement uh, next time around. Um, uh, one question that I have off the top of my head is um, how much um, the program cost. I know there was a you know I guess a minimal hard cost um, to Metro and you all. Um, yeah, for Walk Bike Nashville, I mean, we spent some staff time. We have a grant with the city to do um, community engagement work, and then we spent maybe uh, $500 on yard signs, and, and that was a change from the spring, but it was a, a relatively affordable from, from our side, um, apart from our time. Mm -hmm. well, what would, oh, go ahead, Derek. Sorry, on the city side, we did calculate labor. Um, don't have the exact number, but it was under $100 per neighborhood. $100 per neighborhood. So what would prevent the expansion of the next time that we do a slow street program to, to make it broader? Um, I think one thing we learned was definitely the community engagement is really important. People, people don't like to be surprised by changes to their neighborhood streets. Um, and so that is, you know, time consuming. And, and I think we could have spent even more time um, in the fall to make sure all the council members knew and were able to get the word out and then neighborhood groups could help get the word out. So that that is more work than maybe at first blush it might look. So that would be one constraint, um, certainly. Yeah, that's a good way of uh, looking at it. I guess, can you define for all of us a little bit more about what that engagement process looked like and how much time it took as you were working through all the different neighborhoods? Yeah, Brenda, do you wanna, Brenda did most of that so she can maybe address it. Yeah, okay. okay. Absolutely. Um, so we try to keep in constant communication, even as the applications were, were being submitted. So to just give people a timeline of like, this is when we'll know this roll, roll out. Uh, but basically the week before uh, the program rolled out is when we had the decisions of the locations. Um, and that process of just, it looked like communicating with the residents via phone calls, uh, hosting a Zoom call to help answer any sort of questions, uh, getting residents flyers so they could communicate with the neighbor in a COVID safe way. Um, and then there was a couple of, once the program launched, um, I created like a couple of Zoom meetings just to uh, some residents or, or people who wanted to voice their opinion, had a place to land. Um, and so just making myself available for that. Uh, once the program also launched, we had a lot more people who wanted like yard signs and just wanted to like up uh, the streets like visibility. So there's a couple of uh, trips of driving across town, just dropping off <laughs> in people's front porches uh, so they can then distribute it to their neighbors. Um, there's also, I feel like a, a good opportunity to do some kind of like fun stuff outside, you know, so like tactical urbanism project. Our neighbors had a lot of interest in that. There was neighbors who wanted to do like a community walk, um, you know, or a community bike ride. I feel like those would be really great projects to just like encourage people to, to go outside and in a safe way. And hopefully we're able to keep this past the pandemic as well. Um, thanks for that. And I, the other question I had um, talking about engagement and, and the process uh, really is around, um, and I, I was going back before the call, looking in the report, the blog post that you all did, um, and for everybody on the call, the on the agenda, I hyperlinked the blog post that came from Walk Bike Nashville, where they talked about the results of open streets. And so I, I bumped that up in everybody's email this afternoon, right before the call was starting. Um, but was there any kind of distinction or did you look at some data kind of really related to like HOA neighborhoods versus non HOA neighborhoods and some of those things where, you know, there's, there's already, or even neighborhoods, I guess, where there's a neighborhood association where there's already kind of a pre established group of engaged people to be able to disseminate information through and kind of get that buy in on the front end versus neighborhoods that maybe didn't have some of that infrastructure in place. 
Yeah, we definitely uh, leaned really into that in the application and selection process. So uh, the application had questions like, are you part of a neighborhood group? Is there a like, church or a business or an institution that would support this program? Do you have volunteers identified uh, to help with the program? I think with a with a little bit more more time, it would be great to to be able to expand that and even to be able to like lead residents to conversations of like, how do you get more businesses on board about this or really encourage people to take ownership. But yeah. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, when are we doing it again? And are we going to expand the number of neighborhoods that we do it the next time? I love that question. <laughs> Derek, are you on Derek? <laughs> I am on, and as a staff engineer, you know, it's a little above me, but I'll absolutely support it if we go for it again. I will say, you know, a program with this amount of outreach, um, you know, with our resources, we absolutely could not do without Walk Bike Nashville's assistance. So if they're ready to do it again, uh, I'm absolutely happy to contribute. All right, I'm going to save that statement. <laughs> and record it and send it out to people. And of, and of course, uh, I don't know how many folks on the call. I see um, Councilman Syracuse is, is on, um, but uh, out my way, we had several neighborhoods who were really interested and unfortunately we're not chosen this time. So of course they're eager to, hey, is this gonna come back? And you know, can I apply again? And, and some of those questions. So I will um, definitely let them know that there could be discussion of it coming back. Um, and I think the more that you, I would say as a takeaway to this call, if there's some things we can quantify specifically that council can assist with beyond like disseminating um, the application, um, really I would say related to cost, because I can think of some neighborhoods that probably have enough budget or they would think it's important enough that they may want to contribute you know, the costs themselves, even if, you know, we don't have budget as a, as a Metro department or whatever uh, to look at. Um, but then also, you know, just neighborhoods in general who would be interested in supporting it more that, you know, if, if they can't get selected um, to get it paid for, could they be involved and, and maybe contribute or fundraise within their neighborhood uh, to participate? And I know it's all about bandwidth and, and what, you know, you guys are not huge teams of people. Uh, roaming around, so I know there's a lot of that as well, but then also how can council members support um, maybe more of that community engagement um, piece as well, you know, uh, through our newsletters and through our, you know, regular Zoom calls and, and some of that stuff too. So anyway, I'll just put that as a, um, I, I'm going to send out an email with a kind of a summary of just some other things that I think um, with the opportunities that we had from the legislation and, and these activities from last year, like how can we make them bigger and better and and can we be um, more, I guess, engaged as a council and supporting um, some of these efforts. So I appreciate everything that you all did because I, I just had, uh, you know, FOMO, I think, of not being able to participate in my own area, um, but I was jealous driving around seeing the signs of people having their streets closed. So. Um, I appreciate all the effort that went into that. And I'm going to see um, if anybody has any hands for um, Derek uh, or Nora or Brenda related to this program. Um, feel free to raise them and we, I can recognize you to get those answered. And I'm not seeing any hands, but I did want to transition into kind of a more a broad uh, Q&A if there are people that have questions. I, um, Councilman Syracuse, I do see that you are on the call and and we talked to um benton a little bit earlier um and so i didn't get to recognize you at that time but if you have anything that you would like to say about beer delivery and, and kind of your involvement in working with the beer board i'm happy to recognize you if you'd like to be recognized uh, thank you so much council member um nothing in particular just appreciative of uh, benton's uh, efforts and his team and that we were the the first in the state i believe to, to do this and so I believe it's already shown to have a very positive efficacy for our, our businesses. So I, I appreciate the recognition so much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilman Syracuse, for joining us today. I did hear from Councilman Parker. He um, had a conflict, so he was not able to attend. Um, and so we will not uh, hear from Councilman Parker this afternoon. Um, 
I'm looking to see if there are any other questions about anything related to what we've just discussed, and I do not see anybody's hand raised. I think the biggest thing that I wanted to get from having kind of this deeper conversation about these actions um, is really where can we go from here? Because I know, you know, when you think about um, all of us as linchpins in the community and how we can disseminate information and how we can kind of get community uh, communities involved um, to be able to have access to these some of these services. There's so much going on. I don't want these programs uh, and opportunities to get lost uh, with all the other things that we're doing um, out with rezonings and everything else out there. And I see um, Councilman O'Connell has his hand raised. So Councilman O'Connell, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is for uh, Mr. McDonough or um, I guess also Ms. Lamb, if they're both still with us. At one, as we kind of come through this and have gone through all these programs, I'm for those two in particular, although maybe uh, Mr. Haggerty would know something as well from the Slow Streets Initiative. Did any of these initiatives um, have direct interaction with the small business task force that the council or the vice mayor kind of established last year? Councilman Parker, I'm sorry, Councilman O'Connell, um, I, I... To my, not for the sidewalk cafe permits and the um, outdoor dining permits. We had some interaction when all of this started with Councilman Parker, uh, with some people in the mayor's office, uh, with people like Benton and other departments trying to get, you know, figure out a planning department. Planning, I think, is the one who initially came up with the idea of how to expand this further. So I did, we did not, I, I will say, I shouldn't say there wasn't any. I, I was primarily the person at code working on this, um, these permits for the dining, and I did not have any interaction with that committee. Uh, Benton, I see that he unmuted himself. He may have had some interaction with them, but I have not. I, I was just going to second what what Emily said that uh, that we didn't have any interaction with uh, with them either. Um, you know, we really did most of our work within that one week. Uh, of time right there at the very beginning of, of uh, the pandemic uh, when it really started kicking off. So um, out, outside of that, though, we were really just trying to um, keep the program, uh, keep the program going at, at that point. But that that certainly may be uh, an option for us to, to speak with them moving forward. OK, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councilman O'Connell, and um, thank you to our speakers. Um, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. So, and, and Councilman O'Connell, to that question, I will put that as a takeaway for me to follow up um, with Councilman Glover and that group um, to see if there's interest in kind of connecting the dots, um, since it seems like there'd be a lot of benefit to what was executed and, and to what um, they were trying to achieve last year. So I'll put that down as a takeaway as well. Um, and since there are no additional questions, I don't have any additional questions myself. I appreciate everybody being here. Um, I will follow up with uh, the information that um, I have been noting, especially related to um, you know the the permitting process um, for the the sidewalk cafe piece um, with Evan Kathy. See if we can get some information that we can all plug and play into some of our different resources on online and in our newsletters, uh, and then also some of the other information. Um, Mr. Haggerty, actually, I do I did think of one question. When should I follow up with you about the de a decision around if we're going to do slow streets again? How long I do you would, think that'll take to find out? Well, I'll reach out to our director tomorrow. I, it's, I think, more of a bandwidth issue than anything. And sure. I also need to talk to Walk Bike Nashville. If they're on board, it'll be a lot easier to do. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. So that means next week sometime I should follow up with you. All right. Sounds good. All right, uh, with that, I appreciate everybody joining us today and I will call this meeting uh, adjourned. Our next meeting will be on March the 10th at four o'clock. And thank you so, so much for attending. Bye-bye.